Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, we're going to get uh, straight into our next session. Uh, Mikos Kaspar, he's the head of digital media over at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And he's going to be talking about uh, reading beyond core audiences. Without further much ado, uh, Mikos, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, and good morning. I've got some slides that will hopefully come up in a second. So thank you for the introduction. I'm head of digital communications at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a UN organization dealing with all things nuclear. That is ranging from ensuring that nuclear technology is not going to be converted from peaceful use to making weapons, and then also promoting the peaceful use of nuclear technology around the world. Now, to many people, let's face it, nuclear is not very sexy. Some of my colleagues on the panels yesterday from the UN spoke about children, refugees, environment. These are things that actually many people care about. Nuclear, on the other hand, is a technical topic. Some people like it, some people perhaps are against it, but for the vast majority, they are in the middle, they don't care. They are not aware of all the potential of nuclear. So my job as a communicator at a nuclear organization is to reach these people to reach beyond people who already care about our subject and talk to them, make them see all the potential and the contributions of nuclear to our lives. So how do we do that? That's what I talk about. So at the IA, just like in so many other organizations, digital has become the primary source, the primary method of communication. I spoke about this uh, on a digital panel yesterday. If you were not here and are interested in this topic, please watch the recording. So, we reach about 6 million people a month, which is about five times as many as we did a few years ago, via website and then our social media channels, some of which are displayed here. So to do that, to, to catch, grab, and keep the attention of people who are not, perhaps at the outset, are interested in your topic, you need to be innovative in terms of content creation and also distribution mechanisms. So what does that mean? Uh, well, first of all, gone are the days when people would leisurely browse the internet and end up on your website. There are two ways to get them to your website, really. One is via search engines, and the other one is via social media. So here, I'm showing you the results of something we put a lot of emphasis onto, which is search engine optimization. We make sure that our website is search engine optimized, in fact, hyper search engine optimized, both in terms of the content so that we repeat main words that people would be looking for, main words in the story throughout. And then also, uh, we, we, we make sure that we are compatible with the evolving algorithm of Google and other search engines. So a result we have achieved through this is displayed here. Not sure if you guys know, but PCR, which has become a household name over the last few years, is actually a nuclear-derived nuclear -derived technology. And we at the IEA have, have been helping countries for decades to use PCR to detect viruses. So when uh, the pandemic started, we produced this article to explain how PCR, or actually correctly called RT-PCR, works using nuclear derived techniques. And this is a search engine optimized article that has gotten us 1.3 million uh, new visitors over, over, this, over this last period. So if you search for RT-PCR in Google, will be the first find. If you just search for PCR, well, depending on where you are in the world, we will still be among the top five. Now, but it's not enough to have people come to you, click on you on Google. They also have to then engage with your content. So it's not enough to optimize for search engines. You also have to optimize for your visitors. So that's what we've done here uh, with, with, with these articles. We've recently launched a series called Nuclearly Explained where we use simple terminology and easy to understand content creation to, to make stories interesting and understandable for a general public who doesn't necessarily care about technical details. So I'm showing you some examples of this. Um, we also have infographics, videos embedded in, into these stories. These stories are also evergreen, meaning they don't become outdated. Therefore, if people search for them in six months or in a few years, they will still find them relevant. So, how do we do that? Here's an example of a piece of content that we use both on our, on our website and on our social media channels. This is to compare nuclear energy with other sources of energy. 
So you see on the, on the left-hand side, uh, and this is the Instagram optimized version, we show how much electricity an average person in the world needs in their life. And then we show underneath, and I've magnified that on the right-hand side below, how much uh, fuel, various kinds of fuels, you would need to generate that amount of electricity. So f from uranium fuel, which is what nuclear uses, you just need one egg's worth of fuel to, to produce the electricity each of you would need in your whole lives. Versus if you use coal, you actually need 21 elephants' worth, elephants weights worth of coal to produce the same amount of electricity. Similarly, uh, another simple drawing or, or, or illustration that I'm showing you here is above the elephant, uh, which shows you how nuclear technology can be compatible and actually complementary with renewables. So nuclear technology, which I'm not sure if you're aware, but actually already today generates over a quarter of all low carbon electricity in the world, um, could complement renewables, for instance, solar, so that during the day when the sun shines, the nuclear power plant would produce electricity at a lower uh, rate, and that at night, when there's no sun, it would produce a lot more. That's what you see on a very simple graphic on the top of the slide. So, oops, I, got, I jumped too many. Don't watch. Okay, now watch. So, uh, these are examples of social media optimized content. Unfortunately, they are not displaying very well here. I'm a digital guy, so I've uh, pr tried to show here some slides that move and, and do all kinds of things. We were not compatible with the technology here, so you don't see those wind turbines moving. And here there is supposed to be an airplane flying in uh, at, at the bottom, showing you how even uh, air fuel could be made more efficient uh, using nuclear technology. Anyhow, so these are examples of social media optimized content. Yesterday, at the digital talk, we discussed how the attention span of people is shrinking and shrinking. Therefore, in order to get your message across, you also have to be you know, shorter and shorter. So these are really sound bites and, and images that get across the main message uh, very quickly. So it's, it's, it's an old story that people use digital first content strategy. These days, we now use social media first content strategy. So what does that mean? I'd like to show that to you with an example. The article you see on the left, uh, it's, a, it's an article from a website explaining how you can use nuclear technology to, to detect f uh, food fraud. Food fraud is like fake food. Uh, and, and, and you can do that by, by analyzing the isotopic, com uh, isotopic composition of the food. The article here describes how Slovenian researchers have used this technology to identify fake truffle. Truffle is a kind of mushroom that's actually the most expensive food on the world by weight. It costs up to $200,000 a kilo. So I'm sure we're not going to get that for lunch today. Uh, in the middle, I'm showing you how we would have tweeted this article a few years ago. We would have taken the same image and just a variation of the lead and would have put it on Twitter. For a new story like this, we could have expected perhaps 10,000 people to then click on it and, and, and read our story. What we do these days when we have time is what you see on the right-hand side of the slide. We create a social media optimized image. Again, in this case, it should be moving, which it's not. Uh, and, and a more social media optimized text. So you see, this is more, more catchy for the audience. On the next slide, which again, you won't be able to enjoy it because this should be moving. It's an Instagram story with GIFs. Uh, we created a quiz and, and you know, other interpretation of this, of this same article. So the same content presented in social media in different social media optimized ways would now get us 10 to 20 times as many visitors as the old one uh, would have done a year or so ago. So another example uh, is for, for this article. This article is about using nuclear technology to produce improved varieties, in this case, of, co of cotton in Pakistan. By the way, that cotton then does not become radioactive. And so I'm showing you on the left the, web the website article that we had, and then on the right, an Instagram post, and then, oh, sorry, in the middle, an Instagram post, and further to the right, an Instagram story, which again should be moving, uh, but it's not. So, so same content uh, optimized uh, to the medium. And here is an experiment that we have run using this article on Twitter. On the left, you see this article uh, promoted using a photo that we received from our counterparts, scientists in Pakistan who applied this technology. 
it got only two retweets, so basically zero engagement. We've then looked for another photo, switched it out, and we got 47 retweets. For a niche story like this, which is very scientific, you know, that's a very good number. So speaking of engagement, here is another type of content uh, that I wanted to show you that we use to, to call for action. Social media is not just about us talking to people, but it's also people engaging with our content. So one way to do that is when we ask them a question. Here the question is, nuclear power is, fill in the gap, energy. You know, as I said before, nuclear power generates over a quarter of the low carbon electricity uh, that we have in the world today. And just thanks to this very simple post, we got 150 new followers on Instagram. Another example of engagement is this post, which is a quiz. It's a quiz that we posted on the birthday of Marie Curie. Marie Curie is the only person who uh, received Nobel Prizes in two different scientific fields, in physics and chemistry. And she discovered uh, many of the radioactive elements uh, that perhaps you've all learned about in the periodic table in your school. So it's a quiz about her. It's also an example of what we call non-promotional content. We want to make sure that we don't just post content that's about the IA. You know, that would be like propaganda, or could be perceived by people as propaganda. So therefore, we also produce about a third of our content, which what we call is non-promotional. It is still about nuclear, but it's not about the IA. So this is an example of this, this quiz on Marie Curie. You see, I, I've uh, got the answers colored on the, fir on the first two questions. You can try your luck or test your knowledge on the third. Just go to Instagram if you have a profile, look for IA.org, and then try to answer that last question there. So, so far, I've talked mostly about content generation. Another pillar of the way we try to reach audiences beyond our core audience is by working with others and cross-posting our posts. So really reaching other people's audiences. I'm showing you three examples of how we've done that on Twitter. Tweets we have, we have created here, uh, run by the UN's uh, main Twitter account, then by a social media influencer, and last, on, on the last example, by UN Women. So this way, we get in front of people who may not know or perhaps not care about, so, about uh, nuclear technology, who are not aware of the many benefits that nuclear technology offers. I could have also shown you articles from our website that are picked up by others. Uh, for instance, some of our articles on agriculture are run also or promoted by FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. This way, we get in front of policymakers uh, and researchers, scientists in that domain who, again, perhaps wouldn't have known that nuclear technology has so much to contribute uh, when it comes to improving agriculture. So I've spoken about many things. There's a lot more to say. But if you're just going to remember three things from this presentation, remember to create engaging content, find cool and clever ways to distribute that content through your partners, and also don't forget that nuclear technology is cool. Thank you. Miklos, thank you so much, and really wonderful to have you here in person.